Good afternoon. I thank you all for coming to today's briefing. Uh, I would like to welcome Brigadier General Roger Noble, who is our Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations in ISAF. General Noble will brief you today on his assessment of the security situation and progress of the ISAF mission in Afghanistan. But before I give the floor to General Noble, let me just remind you that the Secretary General will give his monthly press conference this coming Monday at the Residence Palace at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. With that, I hand over to General Noble in Kabul. General, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as you said, I'm, my name is Brigadier Roger Noble. I'm the Deputy Operations and Plans Officer here at Headquarters ISAF in Kabul. I've been here for 11 months and today I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have in relation to the operation because uh, as, we, as we sit at the top I've got a pretty good view across what's happening in the country. I thought I'd start with just an opening quick statement summary. I'd start by saying it's been a tough but productive summer for the good guys and the good guys are the Afghan people, the ANSF and ISAF. The ANSF has increasingly assumed the lead for security and is fighting hard and at great cost to protect the Afghan people and to ensure Afghanistan has a future. ISAF has completed the recovery of surge forces and is increasingly shifting to the advise and assist role. Together, the ANSF and ISAF, which we call the combined team, have pushed the insurgents out of the major population centres in the south and we've seen an overall drop in violence levels. Perhaps more importantly, the Afghan-led fighting is taking places in locations where previously there were insurgent safe havens and increasingly away from the major population centres. As we move into the winter, an increasingly strong and capable ANSF is already initiating plans that is developed for winter and next year's campaign. Already, 75% of Afghans now live in areas which the ANSF are in the lead for security, and the entire country will be under Afghan lead by the middle of 2013. 2013 will see the Afghans increasingly lead in the conduct of the entire military campaign, as well as continuing to undertake the lion's share of the tactical fight. The insurgents have been remarkably unsuccessful during the campaign season and have failed to achieve any of their stated objectives. They are increasingly using tactics and methods that target civilians and show deliberate disregard for the welfare of the Afghan people. The examples of this conduct are unfortunately commonplace. Uh, there are many of them. For example, the Sangin wedding attack, the beheadings of in Helmand, market bomb in Coast, and most recently, the Eid Mosque bombing in Faria province days ago. The insurgents are increasingly employing women and children as weapons and as suicide bombers. Approximately 75 to 90, depending on who you are, percent of all civilian caused casualties in Afghanistan come from insurgent action. ISAF has made further progress in reducing the amount of our own coalition caused civilian casualties and ISAF is roughly responsible for 6% of all Afghan civilian casualties this year so far. With this represents a 50% overall reduction in the year to date in comparison to last year. We continue to work hand in hand to refine and improve our procedures for mitigating civilian casualties with the Afghan government and Afghan national security forces. It's critical to understand ISAF and ANSF do not target civilians. And we work together to reduce all causes of possible conflict-related injury and death to the Afghan people. So in summary, our campaign is firmly on track. Many challenges remain and there are certainly many hard days ahead. But the Afghans and with ISAF in support are making progress. In the remaining 26 months of the ISAF mission, uh, well that the remaining 26 months will really matter and ISAF will be focused on sustaining strong support to the ANSF and the Afghan security institutions as they are lead the, assume the lead in their fight. 
Now I'm ready to answer any questions that you might have. So, far away. Over. Now, turn to questions. Uh, could you please identify yourself so that the General Noble can't know who is he's addressing to? Uh, yes, Dr. Press. Um, Thank you, Brigadier General. Um, this is Ana Pisonero from the Spanish News Agency, Europa Press. I don't know if you can let us know about figures um, of the increase of uh, guarding angels, uh, that means uh, no, NATO uh, personnel that's protecting uh, foreign troops there. Um, and, and just to have a little bit the idea from which numbers we go, so, so to know how much we've increased uh, the, the, the force protection level in this sense, um, and also, if you have any numbers on uh, how many attacks, in, insider attacks, these garden angels have been able to, um, to, to prevent, given that there's an increasing concern amongst many allies, no? with, 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 with the problems of trust uh, that these are creating. Thank you. Yesterday, uh, a guardian angel actually uh, halt or thwarted an attack by an insider threat. So uh, we had a case of him noticing strange action, uh, moving one of our soldiers out of the way and then engaging the attacker who was uh, subsequently wounded and taken away. So it's a pretty good example of what the guardian angel can do at a moment of crisis. The principle is pretty simple, which is that all over the country in every circumstance where the coalition is in close uh, contact with the ANSF, we have, or General Allen has dictated that a guardian angel will be appointed. So that's somebody whose sole purpose is to watch and protect. Uh, so that's a feature of operations across the country uh, in every situation where we're in close contact with Afghans. I guess the key to understand is that that alone is a deterrence. So the Afghans know that. Everybody knows there's a guardian angel and he's often normally highly visible. So the deterrent effect is real. Uh, we know that in the case yesterday, that in a crisis they can respond and assist. They can also mitigate uh, an attack once it starts. And we think it's a very effective way of reducing the impact of insider attacks. Certainly very difficult to ever stop insider attacks, as we saw yesterday. We've had a, uh, another one down in Helmand with the British, uh, but it's a key element in our force protection. The only other thing is, uh, the key thing to stress is that we've talked about it with the ASF partners, both right at the top national level and all the way down, and they understand uh, why we're doing it, and they understand the logic of it, and they support it because they too are actually victims from similar attacks. So that's the end of that. Any follow-up question on You have a follow-up question? Um, um, sorry, I didn't quite catch if you mentioned a total figure. No, we don't have a figure of how much attacks um, these guardian angels have been able to stop. And also if we uh, have a bit the idea of the of the number of ISAF troops that are actually acting as guarding angels, just to have an idea. Thank you. Countrywide. Thank you. Well, there's no number of ISAF troops doing it. Every single ISAF activity that is conducted in close proximity with the Afghans will have a guardian angel appointed. And that, so, uh, there'll be a lot. Uh, the second how many they've thwarted? As I said, they have a deterrent act. So we don't always know when they deter an attack. Uh, we do know that in a, a series of attacks, they've been instrumental in ending the attack or limiting its consequences. But we couldn't, there would be no way to give an accurate figure of how many have been deterred or by the mere presence of a guardian angel. Over. Next question. Uh, yes, this is Mina Skow of the Danish News Agency. At the last uh, Defence Minister's meeting here in Brussels, uh, there was talk about organising a seminar or a conference uh, with experts to talk specifically about the issue of insider attacks. I would like to hear uh, your ideas of what this kind of seminar or conference, what kind of ideas uh, you think it would be useful for them to explore. Yeah. 
Um, I'm aware of the proposal for a conference. We we put a considerable amount of effort into analysing the nature of the uh, insider threat problem. We, to be brutally honest, can't wait for a conference. And we've done it with everybody in theatre, including the Afghan. So uh, the key issues for us is what we would do anything we possibly could to mitigate the risk and to learn about the nature of the attacks and to adopt any procedures we could to reduce the risk. So ways that outside experts can help us is analysing the psychology of you know, the attack motivations. In fact, we've got a guy here, we've already brought people in to help us do that, so to analyse why the attacks occur, what the signs are, what the profiles are of attackers. Uh, it's important to understand the history of these things. I was reading today of an insider attack that occurred in 1915 in western New South Wales in Australia. Two Afghans attacked uh, an Australian train in the middle of the First World War uh, and their motivations were religious uh, support for the Ottoman Empire and disgruntlement with local um, treatment. So insider attacks per se are not a new thing, but understanding them, particularly in Afghanistan and particularly uh, the cultural sort of peculiar circumstances for Afghanistan would be helpful. Uh, and then, I guess, we approach the problem sort of in depth. So we look at all the means to prevent, prevent it. So identifying the threat, understanding the threat, and then conducting counterintelligence operations to interdict and catch possible attackers. Plus, through to the force protection measures we talked about before with Guardian Angels. And then our training and preparation, both of ISAF, which is very important, so they understand the operating environment and the people they're dealing with, but also, and this is what we've done with the Afghans, is training the ANSF to understand ISAF. So as General Allen says, the, you know, ISAF's job is to be a good guest in Afghanistan, but also uh, the Afghans' job is to be a good host. So any experts who have detailed knowledge of the nature of this type of threat, why it occurs, what can be done to mitigate it or stop it, um, would certainly always be welcome uh, from us, that input to help us shape our responses. Over. Agence Europe. Uh, yes, General. Uh, Jan Cordis, Agence Europe. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the Afghan forces, forces are in need for 80% of all uh, operation in Afghanistan. I would like to ask you uh, what is the exact proportion of uh, this operation where the Afghan forces are acting completely alone without any kind of support from ISAF? Thank you. I couldn't give you an exact figure, but it's high and it depends how you measure it. So, uh, you know, most police operations are Afghan led and executed because the police live and operate in the communities uh, where they are. With the army, uh, it depends on the parts of the army that you're talking about. So, uh, what's a good example? Probably special forces do. So, and some of the special police units do quite a lot of, lot of unilateral operations through their own system. Uh, the army as a whole is increasingly doing more unilateral operations, but to give you an exact figure would be difficult. We know the partnered operation because we, we're obviously there with them, and that's over 80% now. I think the big thing you need to pick up is how, quick, how much that's changed in the last 12 months. So, for example, in the Special Forces where ISAF, Soft Special Forces, the 27 task force are drawn from all over the world, their partner forces have gone from about 25% at the beginning of the year to over 75% Afghan-led operations in our, in our partnered operations. So that's not a perfect answer for you, but certainly they're doing unilateral operations. They're getting much more capable and they're good at it. It depends on the part of the ANSF you're talking about. I've just thought of another part that's pretty important, which is the police special vetted units, particularly counter-narcotics, etc. 
and they regularly do uh, police evidence-based operations that are Afghan only and Afghan-led, and they're very, very successful. So, for example, in counter narcotics, because of the Afghan legal system, they have a 97% conviction rate. So, depend what you'll see, the trend line is more and more unilateral operations and more and more independent capacity from the ANSF. Over. Uh, yes, <laughs> if I can see my questions. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, Brooks Signer, Jane's Defense. I have three uh, IED related questions. Um, first, I'm wondering what kind of counter IED equipment will ISAF hand over to the ANSF, and where are the most important regions to place this equipment in your view? Uh, secondly, ISAF has developed an extensive forensic library of IEDs, as you may know. Will the ANSF have full access to this database? And if so, how confident are you that it will not leak to the insurgency and others? Thank you. That's a technical question. Um, the simple answer is we're well and truly down the track of uh, helping the ANSF build and field its counter ID capability. Uh, it's a vulnerability for the ANSF because IEDs are the biggest killer in theatre of the ANSF, the ISAF and the Afghan civilians. So, for example, you're 62 times more likely to be killed or injured by an IED than a coalition airstrike. It is by far and away the biggest for cause of injury uh, to Afghans. So what we've done in both the police and the army, uh, there are dedicated uh, counter ID units and there's a counter ID school established in Mazari Sharif. We're doing at the moment what we're calling around here the counter ID surge. So we're focused on the force, make, trying to expand and accelerate the training capacity in the force and also uh, giving it equipment. So Already quite a lot of equipment's been distributed, so basic IED sort of packs that have gone out across the cores of the army and the police. And we're also giving them a range of route clearance capability, notably uh, mine rollers, etc., for their vehicles. So uh, we're finding, it's like anything, if you look at the history of IEDs in the West and our response, it took us probably the better part of eight years to come up with a holistic, co co comprehensive response. So the other part of the equation is we're helping them build their organisational response to IEDs, trying to look at it as a system and uh, attack the whole network of IED emplacement, production, etc. Now, there's still a fair way to go, and it is a critical uh, thing to deal with because it's a high source of attrition on the ANSF. We share information with them. We have a counter ID exchange constantly and we also have counter ID uh, conferences with them. We do share data but not all of it. I'm confident that the data that we do share is protected. And then we're expanding that sort of cooperation into related areas that support counter ID. So for example, forensics and biometrics. Uh, we do share actually some limited biometric data with the Afghans. It's pretty limited at this stage and they're sharing it with us. So what you're seeing is a steady increase of sharing and a building of their system, uh, which is, it's got a long way to go, but it's pretty impressive how far they've come in the short term. So there are guys sitting in Afghan jails right now, for example, who have been convicted on forensic evidence taken off uh, IED, so mainly fingerprints, so it's basic level stuff. So that probably gives you an overview of um, where we're headed. We're hoping that uh, we build a resilient, sustainable system that works for the Afghans. So they're not necessarily going to have all the bells and whistles that you see in the West, and they don't have the money for it. So we're trying to make something that works, that's effective, and uh, supports them in the field. Over. Who's next? <clears throat> Efe? Hi, this is Mari Villar with Efe, the Spanish News Agency. Uh, I wanted to ask about the security situation overall and how it has evolved during the last months, uh, considering that some countries have expressed their will 
if the situation allows to speed the redeployment of troops. Uh, what's your analysis of the of the last months? I sort of uh, summarised it before. The way to look at it is, uh, it's basically a positive trend, uh, and it's slow improvement. So it's not a massive improvement everywhere. It's just incremental across the country, and it's reflected in the surveys we do that give you the perceptions of what people think. So there's a general sense that security is improving, um, and there's a over much of the country, there's been significant improvement. So to give you an idea, in the beginning of October, 11% of all enemy attacks occurred in only three districts. So it's increasingly in rural areas, the violence is found in the south and the east and the main areas. Uh, and, but it is slowly trending down. Uh, we think the campaign plan is pretty good, um, which has us building capacity in the NSF. And probably the biggest outcome of the surge is we've now almost got the ANSF fully fielded. So it's up at about 340,000 troops and policemen in the field. So they're increasingly taking a lead. That's costing them for casualties. And that means that and the insurgents are increasingly on the back foot and being using extreme tactics. So now the insurgents are fighting Afghans rather than the coalition. But what's important is the time in the plan to go is important. So we need to continue to invest in the Afghan capacity and to advise and assist them as they, if you like, glue their whole system together. So there's a lot more to it than just fighting in the field. The Afghans are good at that. But it's can they run the army? Can they do personnel promotion? Can they sustain the force? Can they fix their equipment? Can they uh, have effective command and control, etc.? So we think that's what we're doing next year. We're supporting them as they take over the lead for the campaign, and that's pretty important. Um, so the Lisbon timeline and the ISAF campaign plan, which have the transition to Afghan lead by mid next year, and then the steady uh, drawdown after that till the end of 14, is a good plan and a good timeline. Each country is going to do it at once, as it always does. Over. General Nobel, I would like to add to what you said that uh, our, trans our strategy and timeline remain unchanged, as the Secretary General has said uh, many times, and we are not discussing the speeding up transition. So our timeline remains, as General Nobel said, to hand over full security responsibility to the Afghan security forces by the end of 2014. And of course, as transition moves ahead, also we will see drawdowns, but all that will be according to plan. General, I think everybody's satisfied with you, what you share with, uh, with the press corps in Brussels. No more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for this useful briefing, General, and thank you for your time. Goodbye from Brussels. All right, see you later.